I've often mentioned to you that many times there are a lot of passages, especially in the parables of Jesus, that have more than one meaning. And that depending upon the circumstances you're experiencing in your life, your mood, or other factors, when you read the same story, sometimes you get a different message out of it. Um, one way of looking at the parable that Jesus tells in Luke 15, 11 through 32, is to see it as the story of a desirable dad or a fantastic father. Uh, and when you take the story this way, it's about a dad who loves his child so much that he forgives him. Even though the son or the child has really messed up in a very bad way, possibly causing shame and disgrace on the family name and all, yet the father forgives the son anyway. A more traditional interpretation of this parable calls it the parable of the prodigal son. Luke, again, Luke 15, 11 through 32. When you look at the story this way, with the more traditional way, uh, it's about a child rebelling against his father and finding out the hard way that just because the grass may look greener on the other side of the fence doesn't necessarily mean that it's better. Well, this morning we looked at it the first way. We looked at it as the parable of the desirable dad. Tonight I want us to take the more traditional approach to this parable. Um, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Luke 15, and as we read through this parable this time, I want you to pay careful attention to the other two main characters in the story. This morning we focused on the father. Tonight I want us to focus on the two sons. Let's read Luke 15, 11 through 32. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizen, one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this, son was dead, uh, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, him, has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this, brother, this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost 
and is found. I want us to look at the two brothers. And so let's start by looking at the younger brother. Now, as we consider the younger brother and the things that happen in this parable, it might be helpful if we understood a little bit of the Jewish traditions that are involved. And when I say Jewish traditions, it's more or less the law is what we're talking about. What the, what the law said. Now, first of all, concerning the estate, the father's estate upon his death was to be divided into thirds. And the younger son was to get one third. So they didn't have to worry about wills and stuff like that. Though they could, if, if they chose to, they could make slight alterations to this. But, but by and large, it was the, his estate would be divided into thirds, and the younger son would receive one third. Why thirds if there were only two sons? Because the law said in Deuteronomy 21:17 that the eldest son was to receive a double share of the estate. So the, if there were two sons, the estate was divided into thirds. The older son got two thirds. The younger son got one third. If there had been four sons, it would have been divided into fifths. And the, the oldest son would get two-fifths, and everybody else would get a single fifth. And so on and so forth. So you get the idea. Now, of course, also in considering the tradition of the Jews, we have to consider the pigs. Leviticus 11.7 says, And the pig, though it has a split hoof completely divided, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. Pretty cut and dry. And again, as I mentioned this morning, uh, Jesus maybe brings the pigs into play just sort of to rub the Pharisees because they were ones that uh, were, uh, th this parable was spoken to. But the traditions of the Jews only tell us half the story. We also need to look at the boy's actions, what the boy does. And, and there are two separate uh, categories of actions that I want us to look at. The first is his rebellion. And in his rebellion, notice he asks for his share of the estate. And again, like I said this morning, what he's saying is, since I'm going to get this when you die anyway, I want it now. I don't want to wait until you die. I want it right now. This is a slap in the face to his father. Plain and simple. There is no other way to look at it that's not being overly harsh. That's exactly what he's doing. He is saying, Dad, I want what's coming to me, and I don't wait, want to wait for you to die. You may as well just die right now and give it to me. Now, I'm sure that the father expected his son maybe at some point to leave home eventually, but uh, not under these circumstances and certainly not in this way. In fact, if we go back to those traditions or the law, Exodus chapter 20 verse 12 says, Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. We probably recognize that as the seventh of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. This son was obviously not showing honor to his father or his mother for that matter. The mother's not brought up in the story, but, uh, but you have to figure she was there and, and was, he was uh, uh, disrespecting her as well. So he asks for his share of the estate. Then he leaves home, runs away, lives a wild lifestyle. We've all heard the sort of stories about kids who go off on their own for the first time and make a mess of their lives. And then they come back home and, and their parents help them straighten things out. And then the next time they go, uh, you know, they do a little bit better because they've understood, they've learned those hard lessons. Well, this son apparently hasn't learned those hard lessons. He, he doesn't save anything for a rainy day. He spends everything that he has and then... The economy turns sour. He runs out of money. And oddly enough, when he runs out of money, he runs out of friends as well. No one would give him anything. And so he, he, uh, he finally, this famine hits and he, he loses everything he's taken from his dad. And he finds himself, due to his rebellion, in a desperate situation. A very desperate situation. So desperate, in fact, that he takes a job feeding pigs. Now, again, you know, 
no self-respecting Jew would have anything to do with pigs because pigs were unclean. Yet he is obviously in a very distant country that doesn't have the law of Moses, that the law of Moses does not apply to. And so he, he finds himself sent into a, fig, a, a field to feed pigs. See, the law said that they were unclean, meaning don't eat them, don't touch them. The truly orthodox Jew, the truly law-abiding Jew, would say, not only that, I won't touch them with a 10-foot pole. And in fact, they would take it even more uh, to a further extreme if you wanted to be a Pharisee and you were looking around an a, a area and you saw a pig, you turned your back because you didn't even want to look at a pig. You know, touching and eating, that's one thing, but don't even look at the pig uh, for, for the Pharisee. That tells us a little bit about his rebellion about the way that he, he leaves home and, and the, the bad way that he treats his, his family and his father and some of the results of those decisions. Second category of his action was his repentance. His repentance. As he is sitting in the field, feeding the pigs, longing to fill his stomach with the junk, with the garbage, that was being fed to the pigs. All it took was a simple remembrance of his dad. How many of my, my dad's servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death? That was all it took. He remembered his dad. Now what would happen if when he had left the dad had said, you know what? Get out. Don't let the door hit you on the way out and don't ever come back. Well, we don't have to worry and wonder about what would have happened because it didn't happen. Because the father didn't do that. The father uh, did what he could to support his son. His son goes off and, and loses everything. But, uh, but the father, you know, he's the son still has in his brain, he says, well, you know, maybe if I go back, he'll take me back just as a, as a servant. Now, and we talk about that. There were three classes of servants in the Jewish uh, hierarchy, if you will. There were what was called the bondmen. Now these bondmen were servants in name only. In fact, they were practically a part of the family. If, uh, if, if you know, something were to happen, that the head of the family wouldn't hesitate to take care of a bondman because they were they were as close to family as you could be without actually technically being family. Just below them were what we, we would call just the plain old servants. They had a harder life than the harder life than the bondmen. They uh, uh, weren't quite as close to the family. They were more on the out, outer fringes of the family, if you will. But, uh, but they still, you know, there, there would be a chance if they needed something that the head of the family would, would help out with, with whatever. And then you had the hired servants. The hired servants were folks who were, well, <coughs> they were hired by the day. And, uh, well, they could be dismissed at any time for anything. If uh, a hired servant was in the field uh, doing, uh, picking the crops or whatever and, and stopped for a moment to wipe his brow and the foreman didn't like the way he wiped his brow, guess what? He could be fired. Didn't have, any, any, uh, didn't have to have a cause or anything. He could be fired for whatever, at whatever for anything at any time. These folks lived on the, on the very edge of complete destitution. And this is what the son wanted to be. He wanted to go back and be just a day laborer on his father's farm. True repentance acknowledges the undeserving nature of forgiveness, the fact that they don't deserve the forgiveness. And the fact that he is willing to come back as the very lowest of the low on the totem pole shows that he's maybe learned his lesson. He understands now 
But when he gets back, he was never given a chance to beg. Verse 21, he comes back, he acknowledges his sin. Or in his plan, he acknowledges his sin. Uh, I've, uh, uh, I've sinned against heaven and, and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. <laughs> the father interrupts him at that point, point and says, Oh, just, just stop. Bring the best robe and put it on him. And with very, he interrupts with very different orders. Even in verse 24, saying, This my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. They begin to celebrate. Well, that's a pretty intriguing story. And it has a happy ending. But the story doesn't end there, does it? We've got it. We're, we're introduced at this point to the third main character. And that is the elder brother. Now again, we look at the Jewish traditions and or law, as it were. Uh, the estate rules, remember? Uh, he was to receive two-thirds of the estate at his father's death. Again, the father had two sons, divided into thirds. Older son gets two-thirds. Now no wonder he is upset. Because according to some commentators and scholars, now that two-thirds of the original estate has to be divided into thirds again. And then he's only going to get two-thirds of his original two-thirds. Which equates, you know, I'm not any into math or anything like that, but equates about 44% of the original estate. Whereas he was supposed to get 66.666 repeated, you know, two-thirds, whatever that is as a decimal. He, he's lost 22% of his inheritance. That, no wonder he's upset. Now, that's according to some scholars. Other scholars say no, because when the father tells the older son, all that I have is yours, means he's not going to redivide his, his estate, that the, the older son is still going to get his two-thirds of the original estate, but that the father now expects him to take care of his younger brother. And make sure that his younger brother doesn't suffer any need after he is gone. But either way, you know, we maybe can understand a little bit about why the brother would be so upset. But then you have the boy's words. Remember, we looked at the younger brother's actions. We'll look at the, the words of the older brother. Because the older brother represents the Pharisees in this story. Remember Luke 15, 2? They didn't like the idea of who Jesus was associating with. Remember, they, they didn't like the idea of quote-unquote sinners going to heaven. So the boy's words, first of all, all these years I've been slaving for you. Now, all this time he's been grimly doing his duty. No thrill in his work, no pride in his work, no love in his work. Just doing his duty. All these years I've been slaving for you. Now how many of you have a father who would have, uh, well let's just say taken some disciplinary action if you had spoken like this to him? And you don't have to answer if your father's here, okay? But, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, this, this son is, is, you know, I mean, you know, he's, he's almost trying to turn the father into the bad guy. And all these years I've been slaving for you. And then, <laughs> I've never disobeyed your orders. Again, if your father's here, you don't have to answer. But how many of you never disobeyed your dad? Right, yeah. This guy is clearly... Uh, John, uh, stop checking with your son. You know, okay, no. Uh, this brother has an extreme case of the self-righteousness. I mean, he saw himself as a good man with zero faults. That actually was his biggest fault, if you think about it. I mean, again, again, besides, how true could his words be? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just been slaving for you, always doing everything that you tell me to do, never disobeying. And then, this son of yours, huh, he refuses to even call him his brother. 
this son of yours. But notice how the dad turns it around on him and he says, no, this brother of yours, this brother of yours. <laughs> you know, there are two groups of people who are here tonight. They're saved and there's lost. Which group do you belong to? But before you answer though, you've got to understand there are some subgroups within the groups. Uh, first of all, there are those who are lost and know that they are lost. Then there are some who are saved and know that they are saved. And then there's another group though who think that they're saved, but they're not saved. They're, in reality, they're lost. These are the type of people who think they can be good enough to deserve to be called son by the Father. These are those who think that they can be good enough and see themselves as a good man or woman without faults. If you ask them, oh, they're happy to point out where you need to improve. They're happy to tell you what your faults are. But if you dare even think about telling them some of their faults, oh, they're going to come down hard on you. Yeah, I call this the older brother syndrome. You know, they, even when people repent of sins, they are still skeptical and question if forgiveness ought to be granted. I had an experience one time where we had a couple that was attending church with us. The, the wife had been baptized, was a Christian. The husband had not. And we were talking about certain things where the uh, husband had a, le a level of expertise and uh, we, were, we were talking with him about it, but some people said, well, he's not a member, so he really shouldn't uh, be involved in this sort of a discussion and everything. Well, as it turns out, we had been, uh, myself and some of the other younger couples had been working with him and, and talking to him and studying with him. And shortly after all this took place, he was baptized. And I didn't witness this happen, but several people who did said the same thing happened. But there was a certain lady in the congregation who, at his baptism, peeked her head in the back door of the auditorium and said, I hope he's doing this for the right reasons, and then walked out. Now, I, I, she better be glad that I didn't hear it. She better really be glad that he didn't hear it. Because he was doing it for the right reasons. I'd studied with him. I knew this. She had a bad case of the elder brother syndrome. And that's always a bad thing. If this is you, let the Father speak to you tonight. Learn the joy that the younger brother experienced when he repented. We also have some younger brothers here tonight as well. Everything in your life was great until you woke up and found yourself in the pig pen that leads to sin, that sin leads to. You can come home tonight. Maybe you need to be baptized um, to wash the mud and pig smell off you. We can do that. Or maybe you need prayers of forgiveness or strength. We can help you there too. Or maybe it just needs to be something personal just between you and God where you're at. A private response. The point is that if you are not at home with the Father right now for whatever reason, you need to come home tonight. Whatever it takes, you need to come home tonight. If it takes a private response, you need to privately respond and pray asking God for forgiveness. If it takes a public response, you need to publicly respond. Don't leave here still wandering far away from God. Come home. And come home now. If we can help you through a public response to do that, won't you come to the front now as we stand and sing together?